Eyewitness News, the Chicago area's leading news, with John Brewery, Diane Burns, Jim Rose, and Steve Deschler. Good evening. The wife of the man who has reportedly given police clues to solving the Palatine puzzle is speaking out tonight. Rose Ferracci says that she and her husband Robert had absolutely nothing to do with the restaurant massacre and talks tonight with Eyewitness News. Chuck Gowdy just got off the phone with Rose Ferracci and has her story from the newsroom. Chuck? John Rose Ferracci has kept quiet since her husband was arrested last month for murder, but she has been stewing over news reports that she had snitched on him, implicating him not only in a brutal Barrington murder, but also in connection with the seven restaurant killings in Palatine. She called Eyewitness News, and a few minutes ago, I interviewed her for the first time. Mrs. Faraci, seen yesterday at her husband's court appearance in Rolling Meadows. There have been numerous news reports suggesting she went to police and turned in her husband, Robert. 25-year-old Robert Faraci held without bond this evening under indictment for the decapitation killing of Dean Fawcett of LaGrange Park. Mr. Fawcett was found minus his head and hands last January along some railroad tracks in Barrington, killed reportedly because he was about to expose a bad check ring that Faraci and his friend Paul Madrowski were said to have been running. I know that Paul Madrowski did Barrington because Paul Madrowski wanted to kill me and my husband if we ever said anything. Why would he want to kill you and your husband? Why? Because we knew, we knew too much about it. Can you tell me how you knew so much Paul about Barrington? Paul Madrowski had told us he did it. By himself? Yes. Do you know who did Palatine? I did not tell the police that my husband was involved with the Palatine murders. My husband was nowhere the Palatine murders. He was over at my house with family at a party on January 8, 1993. My understanding is that the police have now, uh, have now been telling certain reporters that in fact that alibi has checked out. Well, see, I'm reading newspapers every day, and I got all the papers today, and they're still saying that my that I told the police my husband was involved. Rose Faraci called from a pay telephone telling me she now lives alone, without police protection, which would make some sense if she's told detectives as little as she claims. The mother of the other man charged in the Barrington murder, Paul Madrowski, is quoted as saying she doesn't think that the victim, Dean Fawcett, is actually dead, that the headless torso belongs to somebody else. Rose Faraci emphatically says Fawcett was murdered, and she says Madrowski did it all by himself. John and Diane, that's the latest on this from the newsroom. Thank you, Chuck. A possible break tonight in a string of arson fires. This is the work of an arsonist in an alley on the south side. More than a dozen garages have been torched in Marquette Park in the last week. And tonight, two arson suspects are in custody, charged with setting four of the fires. Police say the two men did it simply for personal gratification. Cheryl Burton has an update on the investigation from that neighborhood. Cheryl? Well, Diane, police say these are three separate incidents involving fire setting. Now, two Chicago men have been arrested in one of the fire setting incidents. They say they have no evidence to link them in connection with the other two fire settings because the mode of initiation, how the fires were started, are very different in all three fire settings, including this one here. Now, this is the 6200 block of South Troy, and police have made no arrests in the fire that has destroyed this garage, so police say they are continuing to search for more suspects. Charred remains of cars sit among the rubbish of these burned out garages. The early Tuesday morning fire spread to several garages and slightly damaged a nearby home in the 3900 block of Nora Street on Chicago's north side. Authorities suspect arson. Just 24 hours earlier on Chicago's southwest side, investigators say arson was also the cause of 13 garage fires that early Monday morning. John Scannell's garage was destroyed in those fires. He sifted through remains of what used to be a storage facility for appliances as insurance adjusters check out the damage. What did you lose in this fire? Oh, just miscellaneous household items, stove, refrigerator, washer, dryer, few window air conditioners. When it happened, I got my kids out because the flame was just going so, so high and blowing all over the place. You know, I, all I could think of was, you know, how dumb can we, kids, I don't really know who did it, but to me it seems like it was just done as a stupid prank and it got carried too far. Over the weekend, about a mile away, near the 5800 block of South Trumbull, four more garages were set ablaze. 26-year-old Carl Schmidt and 25-year-old Eric Stern, both who live in the neighborhood of those fires, 
were charged with arson. Investigators say the men used rags soaked with accelerant to set the blaze. Well, according to bomb and arson investigators, Schmidt and Stern are considered to be pyromaniacs because they set the fires for personal gratification. In the meantime, they remain behind bars tonight, and if they are convicted, they could receive two to six years in prison. Reporting live from the southwest side of Chicago, Cheryl Burton, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. John? Thank you, Cheryl. Illinois investigators have released more information about the murder of co-ed Tammy Zawicki with the hope that in some way it may help find her killer. Her body was found last September along a roadside in southwest Missouri. The cause of the death? Seven stab wounds to the chest. Police are now saying that her body was wrapped in a red blanket, closed at both ends with silver duct tape. And as Jim Gibbons reports, several personal items were also taken. It's been nine months since Tammy Zewicki was abducted and murdered. Police agencies have followed up 650 investigative leads and 2,500 sightings of trucks that looked like this. It was suspected that the driver of a truck seen near the I-80 location in LaSalle County where Tammy's car was found might be the killer. When Tammy's body was found in Missouri nine days later, police found that a number of personal items were missing, but this information was withheld. If we released that information, we were afraid that the perpetrator knew that he would discard those pieces, one or any of them, and thus we would be unable to link him back to this crime. The missing items police now hope will lead to new clues include Tammy's Canon EOS camera, similar to this one with an attached lens and black carrying case, a pair of amber eyeglasses with gold-colored bows, gray ASICS running shoes, a large brown purse similar to a doctor's bag, a watch that plays the song Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, and Tammy's South Carolina driver's license. Uh, we've expended... Um a lot of man hours. Uh, our investigative file is in excess of 6,000 pages and it hasn't led us to uh, an individual. Uh, but we are still resolved to uh, locate this perpetrator and bring him to justice. Police are frustrated and so is Tammy's family. There's still a killer out there waiting to kill again. That's a loose end. That's part of our family gone. It's part of our life. Our life will never ever be the same. And at least if we can bring this to some type of a closure, that will be one more step in the right direction. Police still suspect that it was a truck driver who murdered Tammy Zawicki. They say that even the distance between where she was abducted and where she was found, about 500 miles, is a typical day's run for a professional truck driver. But of course, it was reports of a truck stop where Tammy Zawicki's car was found that first led police to that suspicion. Tonight, police appear to be out of leads, and they're asking for the help of the public. The $100,000 reward remains unclaimed. In the newsroom, I'm Jim Gibbons, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Diane? Thank you, Jim. The unsolved murder of another young woman has police in LaPorte, Indiana, dumbfounded still. The mystery behind the death of Raina Rison is still an open case. The 16-year-old body was discovered last month in a lake in LaPorte. The teenager had been reported missing four weeks before that. Investigators say they've gotten more than 100 tips from across the country, but they're no closer to nabbing the killer. Police continue to investigate and are still taking statements. Also in tonight's follow-up file, what remains of the infamous United Flight 232 is about to become history. It was a crash few will forget. In July of 1989, the United plane cartwheels into Iowa's Sioux City Gateway Airport. More than 100 people are killed, but miraculously, 186 survive. The dozens of lawsuits generated by that crash have all been settled. And with that resolved, what is left of the plane is being taken apart today and sold for scrap metal. In Chicago, riverboat gambling could still become a reality. Mayor Daly indicated today he would consider having floating casinos on Lake Michigan on the Chicago River. But he's concerned the boats might hurt the view. And the lake front sees that you're just taking a, a piece of property there that's used for recreation purposes and all that. I, I don't know. I, I really would have to look at it. You really look at it, but uh, looking at it firsthand, I don't think it would be good for Chicago. Governor Edgar says he is willing to support a bill authorizing riverboat gambling in Chicago, but only with daily support. Right. Well, as for the mayor, he was busy today. In an unexpected move, he appointed a new city clerk, the vacancy to be filled by an assistant U.S. attorney. And as Channel 7's Hugh Hill reports, the interim clerk has a big job ahead. Thank you. Tom? 
The mayor's surprising appointment of Assistant U.S. Attorney Tom Scorza as the interim city clerk was clear evidence that Rich Daly wants to prevent any mayoral challenger from hanging the scandal around his neck in the next election. Scorza is there to clean out whatever corruption exists. No office is above the law. No public employee is immune from the basic standard of ethical st conduct. Everybody's going to work uh, a full day for a full day's uh, pay. Uh, we're going to uh, meet our public responsibilities at the highest level of professionalism. Tom Scorza is described as brilliant and scholarly, but a tough prosecutor. The man he replaces, Walter Kozabowski, pleaded guilty to mail and bank fraud and tax violations. Ever since Richard J. Dady ran for mayor in 1955, the office of city clerk has been occupied by a poll. John Marson was there for 24 years and was dumped by Mike Belandic for Walter Kozabowski. Polish politicians like Ted Lekowitz, now county commissioner, want to keep a poll in the city clerk's office. When asked about that, Daly brushed it off. That would take place in 1995. And Daly's political consultant, David Axelrod, said a ticket for 95 is not really a consideration. We don't even know if there'll be an office when we don't know who all will be interested when the time comes, when we don't know if the mayor wants to run uh, with a ticket or simply accept the judgment of primary voters. Scorza will have wide authority. When he reports back to the mayor, he may even recommend that the office of city clerk be appointive rather than elective. This is Hugh Hill, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Well, last October, Daily tapped scores at a head of federal, state, and local task force to fight gangs and drug dealers in Chicago's public housing projects. Sorry. Well, vegetable fats used in cooking oils and in margarine do not increase the risk of breast cancer. Researchers studied women with and without breast cancer, analyzing samples of tissue where fats are stored up for up to two years after they're eaten. Although they found no link to cancer, they say a low-fat diet is still a healthier choice for hearts. And another study is answering how women should be treated after a mammogram finds a tiny cancer too small to feel. Researchers at the University of Pittsburgh say the best treatment for these women is surgery plus radiation. Radiation improves chances of remaining cancer-free, at least in the short term. Well, John, is it possible to outlaw sex? We're trying to do that in Indiana. That story is just ahead. And there's an important discovery tonight about an artist widely revered but misunderstood. Then later on, a train ride designed to pamper the senses. <laughs> but first, Steve Dexter says a little rain is in the forecast. Well, no more wandering Indiana, I guess. <laughs> well, anyway, the showers are going to wander out of here tonight. And there'll be some clearing skies on the way for us. The forecast comes up next. A delicate problem tonight in Bloomington, Indiana. Campus police at Indiana University have a sexy dilemma. They've been given orders to begin arresting students on public indecency charges if officers believe the individuals just engaged in sex. Officials say the night shift janitors routinely find condoms and underwear in classrooms. The custodians have been even reported walking in on couples during the act. Now the university is getting tough, even though officials say it's been a problem for at least 20 years. Well, an historical art find is made in a most usual, unusual place. Letters and photographs belonging to artist René Magritte were discovered by a Belgian woman on a, on a street in Brussels in a trash can in the 1970s. Magritte, whose works are on exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago, is one of the world's most famous surrealist painters. And Charles Stuckey, the curator of 20th century paintings at the museum, tells us his findings may shed new light on the later years. With any number of friends and collectors, um, and offered a running account of his thinking about work. Any information of that sort, of course, is potentially very illuminating. The Dutch TV show that featured the discovery is called in an expert to take inventory of the art finds. Is the Dechler still pondering the uh, Indiana University probe? <laughs> no, I think that the art story was before me because that, for that very reason. That's true. Nobody <laughs> wanted to arrange it that way, Steve. Because I could possibly not say anything without getting into severe trouble over there. <laughs> Let's take a look at the uh, <laughs> situation around here, and you will see that there are some showers passing through. Radar of the last several hours shows the line passing by from northwest to southeast, now in the northwest Indiana. And uh, there will be some clearing skies for us later on tonight. Here's a look at the satellite shots for the last 24 hours. You see those clouds pushing right from northwest to southeast, kind of a... Secondary push of cool air kicked off those showers later on today. 
but there will be some clearing skies tonight and a pretty nice day in store for us tomorrow. In terms of temperature, things are still pretty cool for this time of the year, 51 now in Chicago. But as you can see, back out toward the west where there were clear skies, temperatures are there 60s, and in some cases as warm as the 70s out in the areas of Denver, Colorado. The current temperatures here mainly mid to upper 50s. The lakefront temperature 49, 52 for Midway, 51 degrees of hair. The winds this hour northeast, the barometer on the rise a bit. Humidity now 83%. Now here's a look at the current national scene. Those clouds bloom down to our south. Heavy thunderstorms across Texas and parts of Louisiana once again today. Uh, pretty much clear skies across most of the plains and the Rockies. Out toward the uh, northwestern states, more clouds pushing in there all the way down south of the Great Basin. Most of Southern California is clear and dry. The national radar pictures do show those rains heavy. Look at these big lines of bright to red and yellow echoes. Heavy thunderstorms occurring across Texas, Louisiana. Some of those reaching severe limits today. The forecast map for us tomorrow does show those clouds pushing all the way out of here. Sunshine for Wednesday. Cool air, though. Thunderstorms across the southeast. Rains northeast and New England. Back across the west, there will be thunder showers across the uh, portions of the central plains. Rains across the Rockies and Pacific Northwest. Most of California and the southwest clear, dry, and hot with tomorrow's forecast highs here at more decent levels. They'll be in the area of the uh, 60s. Here's the forecast for us tonight, which does call for showers ending and clearing and cooler. Winds will be north, low temperature 45 at the lake, 40 degrees inland. For tomorrow, partly sunny skies, northwest winds, high 60. Following day Thursday, partly sunny skies and still cool, high temperature 62. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a chance of early showers on Friday, 66 degrees on Saturday, 70 on Sunday, so a little bit of a rebound in temperature for the weekend, but still a little bit below normal. So there. <laughs> so there. Thank you, Steve. Well, it looks like home run hit parades in professional baseball. Jim Rose has that story up next in sports. And Michael Jordan's teammates react to last night's miracle basket. A vintage train from the 1940s now suddenly is rolling again into the 1990s. I'm Frank Manthe. That story's later on. Underestimate me. You killed for them. How many pages? Would you keep me from eternity? No! You don't know what they're up against. I think they're gonna kill me. You wanna be a samurai, Harry? Now's your chance. I want to go home, Daddy. The press calls it a must-see event. Oliver Stone's Wild Paws continues. His top-rated show has America laughing from coast to coast. Now hear what TV's Tim Allen has to say about life in the funny lane. Tonight at 10. You can imagine how Diane feels today, being from Cleveland, the homeboys. I'm from let, Chicago the, now. The, home, the homeboys let her down again. Joel too, you know. I mean, you, but you know, the man steps on the court, puts the cape on, two oh, seconds man. left, and hits the shot. Now I can officially deny him. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the New York Knicks beat the Charlotte Hornets tonight in Game Five, they will wrap up their semifinal series and face the two-time champion Chicago Bulls Sunday afternoon at Madison Square Garden at 2:30 Chicago time in Game One of the much-awaited Eastern Conference Finals. Now, the Bulls returned home late last night after sweeping Cleveland out of the playoffs on the shot, number two, by Michael Jordan. Mark Janowski witnessed the win in Richfield, Ohio. The Bulls certainly needed a heroic fourth-quarter effort after stumbling through most of the game to fall behind by 10 points. Phil Jackson just couldn't believe all the mistakes his team was making. We're just giving them layups. And I, at one point, I just called the timeout and said, you guys want to give them second shots and layups and keep building holes for yourself. And, of course, they answered no, like pupils would do, but they left us in the ballgame, I figured, for those three quarters. We should have been out. But when you have Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan on your side, there's always time for a comeback. How about this move by Pippen to tie the game at 92? Then with the Bulls trailing 99-98, B.J. Armstrong takes the ball away from Terrell Brandon and feeds Jordan, who scores on the drive and fouls out Brad Doherty in the process. But with the score tied at 101, the Bulls needed one more superstar play. And again, Michael delivers. I thought that would have an opportunity to win the ball game once again. Um, and not too many opportunities, not too many times do you get the chance to do something or duplicate something, especially in a place that you, uh, you have great memories and certainly the fans don't really welcome you that well. What's your reaction when the ball went through the net for Michael Schreiber? I was froze. I'm serious. I was froze. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, it was just like the eight and nine shot all over again, and uh, only Michael can make it. Hey, what was your reaction when the ball went through the net in that last year? Got tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to another Michael miracle, the Bulls are moving on to the Eastern Conference Finals, while the Cavs are headed home for the summer. 
There could be some major changes ahead for the Cleveland organization, but Chicago fans could care less because the Bulls' three-peat hopes are very much alive. From Richfield, Ohio, Mark Shanowski, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. All right, Mark, the Indiana Pacers did the expected today and fired head coach Bob Hill. Hill took over a couple of years ago for Dick Versace. Lenny Wilkins, who may soon lose his job with Cleveland after getting swept by the Bulls, is rumored to be the lead candidate for the Pacer job after Rick Pitino of Kentucky made an outrageous demand of $10 million guaranteed over five years. A toxicologist report made it official today. Last month's sudden death of 14-year NFL defensive back Dave Waymer was due to cocaine. Waymer died of an irregular heartbeat caused by the drug, which was found in his blood. He was just 34 years old, left a wife and a small child behind. Both the Cubs and the Sox will play tonight. The North Siders visit St. Louis where Frank Castillo will try and win his first game of the season as the Cub pitcher. The White Sox will seek a little revenge on California at Comiskey Park tonight. Last night, the South Siders were the victims of an 11-4 whipping from the second-place Angels. Despite the loss, the White Sox continued their recent and one game. Pitchers are saying the ball is livelier, and that's why all the balls are flying out of the park. The Sox total of 37 was almost double what it was last year at this time, but even though they were out home with 3-2, it was Chili Davis' three-run blast that put away an 11-4 win for the Angels last night. And speaking of the long ball, Seattle's Mike Flowers put his name in the record book alongside such immortals as Babe Ruth and Jimmy Fox last night when he became only the 13th major leaguer to hit Grand Slam homers in consecutive games. That is eight RBI on two at bat. His average is going sky high. Sure. Thanks, That's Jim. Cool. <laughs> A ride you won't forget when we come back. Now, Floyd Calvert with some of the stories coming up on Eyewitness News at 6. John, a man charged with killing Dean Fawcett of LaGrange Park, Illinois, now claims Fawcett is still alive. At 6 o'clock, reaction from Fawcett's father and the, the latest on the Fawcett case connection with the Palatine restaurant murders of last January. Bond set at $5,000 today for Pedro Lopez, the man accused of accidentally kidnapping a two-year-old girl when he allegedly stole a car last week. And the two finalists for the position of Chicago school superintendent talk about their qualifications and why they want that job. It's a big one. Details of those stories and others coming up on the news at 6. Thank you, Floyd. With the success of airline travel, luxury trains almost disappeared from the landscape. Almost, but not quite. Thanks, Matthew reports. The cars look brand new, but they're not. They date back to the 40s. It's the Great Lakes Western, and it's pulling into the Chicago area from McQuanago, Wisconsin, a small town about 20 miles north of Lake Geneva. You ride this train, and you ride in luxury into another era. The Great Lakes Western Railway is a new chapter in an old story. Vintage railroad cars totally renovated. But they're not just for travel, they're for business. For instance, for business conferences. They have four cars that will take boring business meetings and get them rolling. It's a railroad charter company that caters to corporations and private citizens. We're a perfect uh, uh, stage for, for uh, business events. Uh, we can do uh, social gatherings, uh, uh, fundraisers, and we also do uh, on some specialized trips such as weddings and bar mitzvahs. They operate on tracks owned by the Wisconsin Central Railroad and can pretty much travel the Midwest. You charter the train. You pick your destination. You can travel for one day or many days. It's up to you. On a plane, you'd get there in a hurry. But on this train, you remember the journey. It's going to make uh, uh, life a little bit more interesting. Uh, travel will be, will be longer, but it'll be more personable. We'll have, you'll be meeting people. You'll they have 17 cars in all, including Pullman sleepers and diners. So you can live entirely on the train, or you can have it take you somewhere. For the next few days, the train will be at the Rosemont Horizon, drumming up business. Say you want to take 50 friends for a ride. What's the tab? It can vary as much as uh, 17,000 to 20,000 for a one-day trip uh, with no frills. It can go up uh, to multiple days uh, to 50, 60, 70,000. It depends upon what the customer wants. So the price is high, but then again, time travel does not come cheap. Frank Matthew, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. And coming up at 10, Behind the Scenes with Tim Allen, the star of Home Improvement. That's our news. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.